Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? I don't believe you. How's everybody doing this morning? There we go. I love to hear it. Love to hear it. My name is Ryan. I'd like to be the first to welcome you to our modern worship service this morning. I'm joined in worship this morning by Adia, Derek, Alex, Andrea, and Jake. And we are also welcoming Kaylin to the band as she is singing with us for the first time. Let's give her a round of applause. Please help me in welcoming her. We welcome all, no matter how you identify yourself or others identify you. Know that you are so, so welcome in this space. And we're so happy that you're here. We are a community of people that believes in good news for all. We invite you to uh, please greet each other. Um, take some time to greet one another and perhaps someone that you've seen before or someone new. Um, let's connect as a church. you to remain standing and sing this opening tune with us, The Joy. In the words of Helen Kemp, body, mind, spirit, voice, it takes the whole being to sing and rejoice. Here we go. In the day you have made, so I'll rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad in it. This is where I believe. Every voice, sing it out. That you are more than enough, more than enough for me. You are faithful to your promise. You are strong. church. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, my soul, bless his name, all that is within me say. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, yeah. To your promise, you are strong when I am weak. When I'm standing in your presence, I have everything I need. Yeah. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, my 
so so grateful for you we know that we can depend on you no matter what no matter what we're going through no matter what trials or tribulations the world is going through god we lean on you we depend on you we're grateful for you and all that you've done for us let's sing this out together church here we go oh we're going down to the river down to the river down to the river to pray let's get washed by the water Washed by the water and rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down, down, down to the river. You will be changed. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Never the same. Oh, 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 Kids, you know what time it is. I want to see all of you up at the front. Here we go. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. Got this heartbeat in my chest. No, it doesn't matter about the rest. If I got you, Lord, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. Got this heartbeat in my chest. No, it doesn't matter about the rest. If I got you, Lord, I'm so blessed. Hey, I'm my best day. I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day. You're the reason why. On my best day, I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day. You're the reason why. To be clear, we really love Ryan. Just, you know, we're resting our voices for later today, right? We don't, we don't want to lose our voices for what we have planned later, right? It's just vocal rest. <laughs> so friends, today is a kind of just a fun day. What's today? Yes, everyone has green. Some of us. I have stickers. I have stickers downstairs to protect us from pinches. So when we think about St. Patrick's Day, a lot of times we think about, like, luck. And so I brought what a lot of people think is a lucky charm, right? People think horseshoes are lucky as long as they're this way. If I go this way, it dumps out the luck, right? Are there other, like, things that you guys do that you think brings you luck or you have a lucky charm? What are some of those things that you've heard about? Number seven is lucky for you? Okay. Same. Six is lucky for you? Lucky numbers? Any other, like, things that you do for luck? In college, there was like a statue. If we had a big test, we'd rub the nose to think it would give us a better test score. I think studying probably would have helped more. <laughs> yep, a rabbit sometimes. Yeah, people have like a rabbit's foot. My friend has a rabbit's foot. They have a for, for, for luck, do they rub it? Yeah. 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 Or like, is there anything that you do before like a game that you think helps you with the outcome? Because I know like March Madness brackets are coming up, so people want to learn about these things. Sleep, I think that's the best thing to bring luck for a game. Sleep, rest is good. So, but we don't really worry too much about luck when we're Christians, right? Because we know that really luck and being unlucky, that's really not important. What's important is that we always keep God and Jesus in our hearts and that they're on our team, right? Because even if we have a bad day or good day, we know that with God and Jesus there, we're gonna make it through, right? Things can happen and that's okay, but we have faith in God and Jesus. And especially as we're getting ready because we know God always fulfills promises to us, right? And we have a great big promise that we're gonna celebrate in a couple weeks. What's coming up soon? Easter, right? We're gonna celebrate that resurrection. So we know we are always with them and God and Jesus are always with us. So let's pray together, friends. Good morning, Jesus. Thank you for being on my side. With you, I know I can face anything. Amen. And we can head back with your families or come with me to Sunday school. We're going to move into a time of offering. So please take this time to consider how you'd like to support the ministry and mission of this church. 
If you are a first-time visitor, please know we don't expect you to give. Your presence at Ignite is your gift to us. However, if you consider Ignite and PVUMC your church home, you can give online at pvumc.org. That's pvumc.org. Or in the baskets on our welcome tables as you leave. Love is here, love's not blind in the presence of Jesus. You don't ever have to hide. He is strong. He is kind. In the presence of Jesus, you can hold your head up high. And there is space, space for you to come. Come as you are. Come as you are. You are safe to bring every part to be who you are. Oh, Jesus loves you.
Our scripture reading today is from Genesis 18, 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the oaks of Mamre while he was sat at the entrance of his tent in the day's heat. He looked up and suddenly saw three men standing near him. As soon as he saw them, he ran from his tent entrance to greet them and bowed deeply. He said, Sirs, if you would be so kind, don't just pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought so you may wash your feet and refresh yourselves under the tree. Let me offer you a little bread so you will feel stronger, and after that you may leave your servant and go on your way, since you have visited your servant. They responded, Fine, do just as you have said. So Abraham hurried to Sarah at his tent and said, Hurry, knead three seahs of the finest flour and make some baked goods. Abraham ran to the cattle, took a healthy young calf, and gave it to a young servant who prepared it quickly. Then Abraham took butter, milk, and the calf that had been prepared, put the food in front of them, and stood under the tree near them as they ate. They said to him, where's your wife, Sarah? And he said, right here in the tent. Then one of the men said, I will definitely return to you about this time next year. Then your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were both very old. Sarah was no longer menstruating. So Sarah laughed to herself, thinking, I'm no longer able to have children, and my husband, husband's old. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Me? Give birth? At my age? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? When I return to you about this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Sarah lied and said, I didn't laugh, because she was frightened. But he said, No, you laughed. Can we have another round of appreciation for the music for this morning? This congregation is so blessed with the level of musical talent that we have. It's rare to be in a church where you have a nine o'clock service with that much wonderful music and then you come to another service a half hour later and again are immersed in just immeasurable musical talent. Uh, so we thank you, Ignite Band, for all that you do. You work so hard throughout the week. We are, we are so grateful. My name is Loy. I'm one of the pastors here. And today we will be exploring the connection between openness and generosity in the series Ways to Love as we deepen our understanding of discipleship and walking with God in our lives. In our text for today, we see the remarkable story of Sarah and Abraham's hospitality. So let's take a dive into the significance of this story for us as friends and followers of Jesus. This passage not only talks about human hospitality, it also talks about hospitality to God. It echoes Jesus' teachings in the 25th chapter of Matthew, where he reminds us that acts on behalf of the least of these are also acts on behalf of God. This directly connects the work we do in joining God's mission of reconciliation with others and then hospitality to God. And hospitality to God is not only a spiritual matter, but it involves our whole self in the midst of our mundane affairs, in everyday life. And this includes our physical, emotional, cognitive, spiritual, and yes, even financial aspects of who we are. And although we don't always see the presence of God directly, in our everyday life. God comes to us in the flesh and blood encounters we have with our neighbors. In our culture today, sometimes it can be difficult for us to understand how important hospitality was in ancient Near Eastern cultures because we are much more reserved protective of our homes and spaces and resources, wary of strangers, reluctant 
to take risks, more readily preferring to offer hospitality only to those we know, only to our friends and family. And yet, this is exactly what we need to try to overcome and how we think about hospitality in worship. In worship, we have the opportunity to offer radical welcome to guests and strangers in an open and generous way. So our passage in Genesis for today teaches us about hospitality having three main characteristics. The first, generosity and openness. The second, shared meals and relationships. And the third, entertaining angels unawares. When these three mysterious visitors approached Abraham by the Oaks of Mamre, he and Sarah welcomed them with open arms. And this act of hospitality reflects their generosity and willingness to receive and embrace strangers and practice faith in spite of risk in our lives extending kindness and openness to others can lead to deeper connections and understanding sarah and abraham's hospitality involved sharing a meal with their guests in ancient times sharing food was an act of self expression and character. It wasn't only an opportunity to display culinary talent, but it also symbolized trust and friendship, mutual understanding. Today, breaking bread together remains a powerful way to build relationships and bridge gaps across social and cultural differences. The New Testament echoes the theme of entertaining angels unawares. We see this in Hebrews chapter 13. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Sarah and Abraham unknowingly hosted divine messengers. Their hospitality led to a profound encounter and the promise of a son, Isaac. Hospitality isn't just about physical comfort. It's about creating space for connection, empathy, and shared experiences. A chance for those who come together to be able to reveal something about themselves to learn about each other as persons. When we welcome others, whether strangers or friends, we participate in a sacred tradition that transcends time and culture. Hospitality fosters strong relationships, and sharing a meal can lead to deeper knowledge, deeper trust, and unexpected blessings. Hospitality has ancient roots that help to guide social codes of conduct to both protect and strengthen communities. Semi-nomadic life in the ancient Near East would often bring people from different families into contact with one another. And the location of Canaan as a natural land bridge between Asia and Africa made it a popular trade route. In the absence of a formal industry of hospitality, people living in cities or in encampments had a social obligation to welcome strangers, to give them shelter, to give them food. And from descriptions that we see in the Hebrew Bible and other ancient Near Eastern texts, we find various codes of conduct defining what counts for good hospitality that maintains the honor of persons, their households, and the community by receiving and offering protection to strangers, 
Because the stranger is often transformed from being a potential threat to becoming an ally or a friend by the offer of hospitality. The guest remains under the protection of the host until the guest has left the zone of obligation of the host. We see in this same chapter, after the mysterious visitors come to Sarah and Abraham, the next story is the one of Sodom and Gomorrah. And much has been made about that story in the Christian tradition, about what is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, but many biblical scholars and theologians believe that the real sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is the lack of hospitality, the refusal of those who lived in the city to follow these ancient Near Eastern codes of conduct of protecting and welcoming the stranger because they were too selfish. In comparison to our ancient ancestors in the faith, hospitality and generosity are often underappreciated and practiced in Christian circles today, especially after COVID, where we are still trying to find out the ways in which we can safely share space with each other. And yet, the Bible pictures the commonwealth of heaven as a generous, even extravagant banquet. We see this in Isaiah 26 and Matthew 22. Because hospitality fosters good relationships, and Sarah and Abraham's hospitality provides an early biblical insight into the way relationships and sharing a meal go hand in hand. These strangers reaped a deeper insight into each other by sharing a meal and an extended encounter. And this remains true today. When people break bread together or enjoy recreation or entertainment, they often grow to understand and appreciate each other better. And better working relationships and more effective communication are often the fruits of hospitality. The example of Sarah and Abraham shows that this work can be profoundly important as a service to God and humanity. Hospitality and mission go hand in hand as well. Now, some readings of this passage have been used to treat Sarah unnecessarily harshly. I think that this is an unfortunate and damaging interpretation. Yes, Sarah laughs. But in this way, she demonstrates her humanity and the natural response that any of us would have if we were standing in her sandals. And remember that neither Sarah nor Abraham respond always in ideal ways to the word of God. But laughter in this story is not unbelief. Rather, it's a form of honest engagement with the difficulty of accepting how God can often turn our expectations upside down, even when, in so doing, God gives us exactly what our heart desires, what Sarah so desperately wanted. Throughout the Hebrew Bible, we see individuals questioning God as a genuine part of meaningful, divine, human conversations. Indeed, not to question God can be a sign of a weak faith in the Jewish tradition. And Abraham will do just that in the verses to come in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, pleading for God to deliver the cities. 
What is so interesting and important in this story is that God makes no judgment here against Sarah, even when her laughter is acknowledged and she denies it. God keeps the conversation going. And we would not be off track if we see a foreshadowing, a parallel to what's coming in Holy Week and Jesus' last evening with his disciples when after that sacramental act of hospitality by God, a few hours later, Peter will deny Jesus. And in that story as well, Jesus acknowledges the denial as an honest part of his relationship with Peter. Jesus doesn't judge or condemn Peter for it. Hospitality and pledging, including tithing, also share a spiritual connection, both rooted in principles of generosity, openness, community, and stewardship. And as we've seen in our teachings, tithing involves giving a specific portion, traditionally 10% of one's income to the church and to those in need. The practice of tithing and pledging goes back to ancient Israel, where it was a way to support the most vulnerable of the community, and to sustain religious practices, including worship. For instance, we see teachings about tithing and pledging in Leviticus chapter 27 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. The prophet Malachi emphasized returning the first fruits of one's harvest back to God in chapter 3. And yes, Pledging is a sacrifice, personally and financially. But it is meant to be an act of relationship with God. One that acknowledges that everything that we have comes from God. It is meant to be done with joy and thanksgiving as a response to the generosity and openness the hospitality that we have received in our lives from God. It should not be done begrudgingly or with resentment. It should never be forced on others or used to judge others. In fact, Jesus critiqued the religious leaders of his day who emphasized only tithing while neglecting justice, mercy, and faith. We see this in the 27th chapter of Matthew. For Jesus, all of this needs to be held together. What we receive and what we give and who we are and how we act. Jesus highlighted the spirit of the law over legalistic adherence. And the spirit of tithing and pledging is about how we commit to our relationship with God by taking tangible steps in our lives in concert with what this church calls God's love in action. As stewards of God's resources, we recognize that all we have is a gift from God. Tithing and pledging allow us to participate in God's mission and to support ongoing operations in our faith community and to those in need. And hospitality as a way to love involves welcoming and caring for others, often through shared meals and an open-hearted affirmation of other people's identity and their unconditional worth as human beings made in the image of God. Hospitality is woven throughout scripture. Jesus exemplifies it by 
both giving as a host and receiving as a guest. And just as pledging involves giving back to God, hospitality involves giving to God and to others. Both practices build community, establish and strengthen relationships, and express gratitude. Hospitality strengthens the body of believers. When we host, we build up others. When we receive, we allow others to build us up. And like pledging, hospitality encourages selflessness. It's a way to experience God's commonwealth on earth. And both pledging and hospitality reflect our relationship with God and others through everyday acts of physical and spiritual discipleship. They remind us that we are interconnected, called to give, and blessed when we receive. May we continue to grow in these relationships and in our ability to be both grace-filled givers and grace-filled receivers through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Pray for yourselves. Pray for all of us. Pray for the world together. Gracious God, we come to you as we prepare for Holy Week, as we continue to move through Lent, as we continue to seek ways to be part of your work and mission of reconciliation in the world. as we look for guidance from you, as we pray for strength in our lives to be able to meet the needs that are put in front of us, to be aware of those who cross our paths, to take the time to listen, to hear, to respond, knowing that we won't get it all right, we won't do it perfectly, but that that's okay. All you ask is that we try and that we don't give up because this creation, these people that you have created, are too important for us to pass by. It is why you have placed us here. Help us to be able to quiet our hearts, to still our fears, to gather our courage from you as we celebrate Palm Sunday and then reflect, Jesus, on your final hours. What that means for us individually and as a church and as we experience that pain and grief before we are ready with you to be raised again. And in all these things we pray in your name. Amen. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I have a very exciting announcement. This Saturday on March 23rd at 7 p.m., we're doing my senior showcase before I go to college. It's going to be right here in the Fellowship Center, 7 p.m. This Saturday, we're doing a bunch of pop and rock music, some country and a worship song, and I would it would mean the world to me if you guys were all there. So please, please, please come. The band's playing. I have some friends who are going to come and sing with me. And it's going to be an absolute blast. We have new lights. It's going to be super cool. It's going to be like a whole concert. Um, tickets are in pbumc.org slash events. If you have any questions, 
Um, feel free to ask me after the service, but it's this Saturday, and I would love to see you all there. Please stand and sing this one with me. This is King of Kings. God the source, God the reconciler, and God the sustainer, 
be with you. This week, as you are sent forth, know and remember that you are called and empowered to be grace-filled givers and grace-filled receivers. In God's name, amen. See you next Sunday.